Um, uh, you'll see Kyle today and tomorrow. So today's a little bit of a teaser. He'll be in conversation with Cornelia. Um, then tomorrow is when we get to kind of nerd out and get uh, a little bit deeper. So we're really thankful um, as uh, Cornelia has talked about sort of this way of, um, of thinking about GitOps into the future. And I was really excited to bring on not only Kyle, but we also have Javeria after him as some examples that I wanted to introduce to Cornelia, people who are kind of on that journey already. So here are some great proof points. So we'll invite Kyle onto the screen, who is a lead infrastructure engineer at Under Armour and a good friend of ours. We're really excited. And so uh, the title for this, we kind of put loosely as uh, someone who's going to share GitOps practitioner highlights. Um, and like I said, uh, this will be sort of a highlighted teaser. Uh, so don't miss tomorrow as we'll get to go deeper. But here you'll get some of the great proof points. So uh, I will uh, hand it over to Cornelia and Kyle to uh, share this session in conversation. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Tamo. So uh, first of all, I would like to welcome you, Kyle, um, to the stage and to our event. And thank you so much for being here. Yeah, definitely. It's been an amazing trip with this stuff. It's awesome. Excellent. Excellent. So for starters, maybe you can take just a few moments and introduce yourself a little bit more fully. Tell us what you do, um, what your role is, what your background is, and then we'll start to, to dive into the topic at hand. Yeah. Uh, so I've been with Under Armour for the past six years. I started out as a build and release engineer trying to automate away releases. Um, since then, I've kind of automated that position away. Uh, I moved to infrastructure and are develop, developed internal platform as a service uh, solutions for engineers, sometimes pulling off the shelf, sometimes pulling off open source. Um, and then most recently for the past about a year and a half to two years, uh, leading adoption of Kubernetes and cloud native best practices across the entire uh, engineering organization at Under Armour. Um, a little bit about our team size, we fluctuated anywhere from seven to three members we're four right now uh looking to grow a little bit um but uh it's been a wild ride and we've had a lot of learnings and a lot of ups and downs but a lot of improvement across the org we support uh you know 50 to 100 engineers uh, uh, teammates across the org so we have to scale out uh a lot <laughs> So I think that's really interesting. And, and while I will uh, share with, with our audience here that I've had the great pleasure of spending time with Kyle over the last week or two as we've been kind of preparing for GitOps days, and I've heard some fantastic stories that you're going to hear today and tomorrow, um, I did learn something new here that uh, you came from build and release engineering, which I don't think that's coincidental at all. Um, and if you will, it tracks a little bit what I was just talking about, which is that was the frontier. So build and release engineering, really honing those things around CI, that was the work of the last decade or two. Um, and the fact that you worked yourself out of a job is an indication of the level of maturity. And so if everything goes well, you'll work yourself out of this job and you'll move on to the next thing, you know, maybe uh, five or 10 years from now as well. There's always more work to be done. <laughs> yep, that's right. Very good. Um, and uh, so that's great. You said you you support um, developers. And so that's a theme that, that you as the audience are going to hear quite a bit because we're going to hear from a lot of folks who are providing a set of capabilities to their development organizations because we all know that doing IT for IT's sake of course, doesn't make any sense. There's always got to be some business driver. And the business drivers, to a large extent, are the digital offerings that we're bringing to our consumers. So the Under Armour customers, it's it's facilitating the delivery and uh, of those applications. And so that, again, is something that you're, you'll hear a lot. And there's so many great insights that come from that. So, so I know, and, and over the next couple of days, our listeners will come to realize um, how much you have really embraced this GitOps, all of, all of the things. But when you came to GitOps, um, maybe the first thing that you can do is tell us a little bit about how GitOps surfaced on your radar, the concepts, and even maybe some of the technologies. Yeah, so coming from the build and release side, it was mainly about automation and uh, trying to not have to do things manually. Um, but there was also a big driver to uh, empower our engineers at our organization to self-service. Um, and so 
that means that I have to get out of the way and I have to build solutions or tools or systems that they can use um, to do what they need to do faster, better, more organized, whatever. Um, so it, it requires a big focus on a developer experience uh, or user experience, like making sure it's easy for them. We have a, a saying on our team, make the right way to do something the easiest thing to do because then people will follow it and do it. Um, so there's that. And then we also kind of hypothesized that if we kind of drove all this stuff down into Git, it would provide a kind of centralized place to learn and share. And so we've actually been seeing benefits from, you know, new people coming into the organization can just look at all this stuff and see like, how does Under Armour do this? Or how, how is my team doing this kind of thing from this centralized repository type aspect? Um, getting back to kind of like the speed, we wanted to make sure that our developers could ship more frequently uh, with greater confidence in what they're doing. So speed and reliability, eliminating human errors um, and having uh, like explicit review processes that we could, we could either choose to turn on or ignore depending on the criticalities of what we were talking about. Um, and then we also, we work with money, we sell product. So we have PCI compliance proofing that we need to uh, adhere to. So that can really help uh, drive uh, showing the PCI auditors what you need or what you've done. And, and so then your hypothesis was that for all of these needs around serving your developer community, making the, the easy thing or making um, the right thing, the easiest thing to do, all of those things, um, uh, how, did, how did those requirements lead you in the direction of GitOps? I think it was kind of more organic. Uh, we were definitely kind of cutting edge, bleeding edge at, at a bit of the time. So I wouldn't say it all came at the same time. Uh, a lot of it was driven off the fact that we had such a small team um, and we needed a way to scale out and people are not the way to scale that out. Operations or automation is the way to scale that out and, and giving that over to the developers um, makes it so that they can self-service what they need to do, right? Without having to have me as a blocker and they could build up uh, processes within their team to make sure they're having checks and balances on like when we need to change something everyone is aware of it or everyone approves of it kind of thing. And did you apply GitOps first to solving your problems, solving your problems of scale? Like you needed to deliver something self-service to the, the, the consumer. Um, so did, did GitOps start with your team and then eventually perhaps made it to the development organization? Are they doing GitOps? Yeah, definitely. It was, uh, we started out with like automating infrastructure creation. Um, and so our team heavily embraced it to, to be able to scale out requests. Um, but over time, as we, uh, as our culture changed and we wanted to, what we call level up our engineers, um, we decided to hand over the keys essentially and, and start training them and getting them comfortable with doing this. So on when we started our Kubernetes journey, one of the tenants we had was to make our engineers understand it, the Kubernetes YAML that they were writing. Um, and that has paid spades for us in like uh, other teammates helping each other out with what they're doing in Kubernetes. So everyone across the org knows uh, best practices. And then it just becomes a, the problem for our team after we've trained enough people is when something new comes along, it's just shedding that light for the organization, rolling that out and, and helping train people. And then it just keeps paying spades, which is really awesome. Okay. So, so I'm betting that some of these hypotheses that you had around um, the, the tech, the, the, technologies and the practices that you put in place to achieve the requirements that you talked about have paid dividends. Um, you've had some so. success with that. Um, any major surprises along that journey? Um, pipeline speed, especially around uh, when you're you know, uh, making a change and how fast it gets into production. Teams, we have a lot of different teams that work at different speeds. Um, and their pipeline speed kind of hung them up when they uh, moved over to uh, GitOps. So optimizing that was uh, hugely imperative to successful usage of it. Um, we also had uh, developers getting a little grumpy about uh, power users specifically getting grumpy about losing control because like 
they're used to doing things manually. It's quicker sometimes, especially with like uh, con uh, control, command line controls and stuff like that. So we've had to do a lot of like uh, uh, crafting alternatives or teaching how to break away from the GitOps to do something manually to test or something like that, and then how to get back onto the pipeline. Um, but I think the, the real power comes from when new people come into our org and we have that centralized knowledge repository, essentially, of how, how we do things at Under Armour. Um, and that itself has also unexpectedly opened up, uh, the, the centralized repository has opened up possibilities that we didn't dream of. Um, keeping our dev environments in sync easily is a simple PR or using things like customize to automate and tweak exactly what we need about that specific dev environment. We have one team who has a dev environment per uh, product essentially, and they manage like 20 of them and they can just do it all with GitOps. It's really crazy. Oh, interesting. Now, um, you talked a little bit about the challenge of the power users. Um, any other, did you face any other challenges in convincing either your power users or your leadership or even your own team members? You talked about your team size being anywhere from four to seven. Um, of the value of some of these approaches, um, I would love to hear a little bit more about those power users that, how did you bring them over the hump to have them realize that maybe SSHing into a box, all while it seemed like it was the easier thing to do in the short term, really wasn't the long term. Um, yes, so we haven't convinced all power users. <laughs> it's definitely a hurdle. Um, you you definitely have to provide. You have to really talk to them and understand where they're coming from about you know, the control that you're taking away from them um, and how it will make their life better in the long run. Um, it's, it's always a struggle. Um, we're still struggling with it. And, and, you know, anytime we bring in a new tool or a new way of doing something with GitOps, it's always about the value proposition. So um, you, you got to make that forefront and center and make sure that you're listening to them and understanding, you know, what, what their actual needs are. Because don't put process in place just to put process in place, put it to make everyone's lives better. My life, your life, the entire org's life. Um, and yeah. And what about your leadership team? Did your leadership team empower you and say, you know, solve these problems, let me know when you're done? Or did you have to do any kind of selling of these new cloud native operational practices to them? So, uh, we have been super blessed with our engineering leadership at Under Armour. They are very, uh, they relinquish control of decisions to us a lot. They really trust in us to make the right call. Um, so that has been super powerful. I have not worked in an org that has that like real control of authority at the top. Um, so I can't speak to that, but that is super important to get a good relationship with your, your leadership to make sure that you can roll this stuff out and make sure they're they're comfortable with it. I will say when we were moving into chaos engineering, which is not what this is about, but trying to like sell that, um, it's all about messaging and the value proposition to the business. We, we actually had to call chaos engineering uh, resiliency engineering and we have a resiliency team and that, and that kind of stuff. So it was all about the messaging and the benefits that it was going to bring to speeding up developer pro productivity to maintaining reliability of our deployments and how we ship stuff um, so that they could understand like this is beneficial. Yeah. I've spent a great number of years in the DevOps community myself. And we, at, at things like the DevOps Enterprise Summit, there's many, many talks where we talk about bringing leadership along. And um, we, we actually talk about techniques on how to, um, you know, how to bring in the, the importance of having a leader who comes in with a fresh, you know, with an open mind and, and able to embrace, embrace um, um, fresh and new ideas. And so it's great that you've had that. And for those of you who might be listening, um, this isn't just a GitOps thing, but it's more of a DevOps, DevOps things. As soon as you want to start becoming more modern in the way that you're doing things, uh, the practices you're using, even the organizational structures, um, really getting that that uh, that air cover from leadership is is certainly a critical component. And it's fantastic that you had it from the beginning. Yeah, the thing um, I would add also to that is it helps build that trust. 
so one of the things I started out with was automating our build pipeline. And it was taken you know, six hours with multiple teammates. And I took that down to a fully automated process that one engineer could do in like 10 minutes. And that builds huge uh, trust. And then you can build on that for the next thing that you want to implement, which has been really, really helpful. Yeah. So start small. Don't <laughs> spend six months designing your GitOps, you know, your GitOps ideas. Um, and in fact, one of the things um, that we have a fair number of conversations around is I mentioned earlier the principles of GitOps, the four principles of GitOps. And from a purist perspective, we can say you've got to have all of those things. Unless you have the reconcilers at the other end, then you really don't, you really haven't changed your operational practices at all. You still might have to go in when something breaks and do something manual or imperative. Um, and so we like to say that in order to really do cloud native operations, you need to embrace all the way through to the reconcilers. But you're bringing up a great point, which is, start small. And so would you have any advice for somebody who wants to start small? Like give us a concrete example of, you just did one, for example, automating the, uh, the pipelines. Anything, any other suggestions that spring to mind? Yeah, what, one of the things that we did was look at what was causing pain for this team and try to categorize it. And first take that burden off of yourself because then that gives you the time to do whatever else the org needs you to do. Um, so using data-driven analysis of like what to improve is will put, point you in the right direction and also build a lot of trust with your with your leadership because they'll see you're getting rid of your work or automating away your work. Now you can go do something else and that's really helpful to the business. Um, so start with stuff that you can directly control, small things that help your team, and then slowly start, start to build uh, relationships with team with people outside of your team and uh, bring them in and show them like oh I did this cool thing one of the things we have here at Under Armour is a hack and tell uh, where people like they do something cool and then they explain how they did it or got to it and that really drives teams to like try new things or share ideas and and you know build up that trust amongst each other and even push the envelope sometimes yeah okay well, we're coming to the, the close here for our session today, but again, I will, uh, I will let everyone know that Kyle and I have almost an hour tomorrow to dig into many of the details of all of the things that Kyle has been GitOpsing. Um, in terms of maybe certain requirements that, you know, some of those categories that you just talked about, are, is there another category where you're going to go after, you're going to attack this particular problem space? Where do you want to go next? Yeah, I've had my eye on cluster operations. Right now, our team is responsible for about 14 clusters, not a huge amount in the, in the world, but it's a lot. It's all of Under Armour. Um, and I would love if I could self-service clusters for teams where they they need something they can spin it up or um, and it's this we have this concept of trust but verify so we have some way to verify they're doing the right thing and they can go do it in self-service cluster operations so that's where we're going next excellent excellent well kyle thank you for joining us today we'll have you back again tomorrow so uh a treat for everyone there um, appreciate your time and Tamo or Damani back to you. Yes. Just want to jump much. in real quick because we already have some questions in our Slack. So a reminder to people, if you have questions for the speakers, uh, please join our Slack. Um, I know Kyle, you'll um, be here tomorrow as we mentioned. So um, maybe you can jump in and answer a few, but uh, tomorrow's the day we're going to like really nerd out and dig in. So hopefully there'll be room for that there as well. But um, you do have a few moments. You'll see people there. Yeah, definitely. Okay, I'll be cool. There. So Kyle, see you guys on Slack. So thank you.